All right, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. So what I would like to do today is tell you a little bit about work that I've been doing in the last few months. Uh, I gave some talks earlier this year, so some of you have seen part of this, and I've been trying hard to show you something new. Um, somehow the first and the last talk kind of stole a little bit of the thunder out of what I was going to say, but uh, I guess uh, we can see this a little bit as a summary of the things that we've been doing uh, in collaboration with some folks. Now, one thing that surprised me at this conference is that there have been no claims of a new problem that shows definite speed up for any kind of quantum hardware. And so, so far, maybe things will change. The conference is not over. I think we can say that, number one, so far, the best shown is a constant speed up that Salvatore showed up this morning in his talk for quantum hardware. And what Mario just showed, that there is evidence of poor fair sampling for quantum annealing. So the goal of the things that I will talk about today is, first of all, to introduce new methods to improve the performance of quantum annealing, but also introduce new methods that hopefully raise the bar for quantum annealing. And I want to argue that something alternative that we all should think about, and Hartmut Neven showed very nicely that one can combine classical and quantum hardware or methods, is that we should start looking out for hybrid approaches also along the lines of what Fujitsu has been doing. Now, this has been done in collaboration with my team at Texas A&M, as well as Salvatore Mandra, Firas Hamze, Mario Kuntz, uh, Guillermo Mazzola, and Matthias Troyer. So in the first part, I'd like to say a little bit about fair sampling and how we can solve the problem of what I would say is unfair sampling. Let me reiterate, what do I mean by fair sampling? Fair sampling, in a simple definition, is the ability of an algorithm to find uncorrelated solutions, hopefully with almost the same probability. Now, this is very important because there are many applications that directly depend on sampling. First of all, solutions can be more important than the optimum. And a simple application for this is the molecular similarity problem in chemistry. If you look at these two molecules over here, you will see that they actually have a very similar backbone. And so one thing that is important in drug design is to find molecules that are similar, but they differ slightly such that you can get the same kind of medical let's just say, benefit of it without, say, any side effects. Now, if you look at these molecules, they're very similar, except that they will have very different effects on you. And so it's important to find things that, you know, don't have, say, the effects of heroin, but prevent you from coughing. The other one is that some solutions might be more convenient due to constraints. Usually, when you put constraints into optimization, it makes your life very difficult. And so one thing that you can do is you can solve a problem and then try to include the constraints later. A simple example is, say you have a traveling salesman problem, let's assume you can find many solutions that are perfect or almost perfect for your route, then you can later go in and factor in roughly where the positions of the trucks are parked. So this could save you a lot of effort without having to deal with the constraints. And from a simple optimization point of view, finding the solution to a problem is a good benchmark, but saying I want to find most, if not all, solutions, it's a really, really hard thing to do. As Mario mentioned, we started looking at this back in 2009 with Yoshiki Masuda and Ishimori Sensei, where we looked at this very simple five-spin model you see here. White is spin up, black is spin down, and you have uh, ferromagnetic lines, uh, which are the solid ones and antiferromagnetic ones. And if you look at this, you can sit down on a piece of paper, figure out that you have three ground states up to spin reversal symmetry. Now, if you integrate the simple Schrodinger equation, what you will find is that states two and three appear 50% of the time. And this is what you see right here. These two lines are basically on top of each other. But state one is actually exponentially suppressed. So in reality, if you want to integrate the Schrodinger in the equation, all you find is these two solutions. And so last year, we thought with Salvatore, well, what about quantum annealers? So we decided to design problems with known degeneracy, and we decided to pick couplers according to this distribution, this 5, 6, 7, because it gives you relatively small and manageable degeneracies, and you can then go in, generate several hundred thousand problems, go back, exhaustively try other methods to try to find all possible solutions, and then use this well-curated data set to see if then, say, quantum annealing or the D-Wave device can find these solutions. Now, what we did is you do a basically a systematic study. You fix the number of variables in the problem. You fix the number of minimizing configurations. And then you look at how many times you find a given configuration when you keep repeating your simulation a few 10,000 times. 
And so if this sampling is fair, what you expect to find is, if you rank order the times you find the solutions, a distribution that is roughly flat. If the sampling is unfair, well, then you find something like this, okay? Something that is obviously skewed or biased. We did the experiment on the D-Wave, and these are the data that we get. This is just one system with 968 variables, and for different degeneracies, the orange one, well, kind of looks like bird poop, um, but the one that says k equals 6 is the one with the largest degeneracy in this case. And you can see nicely that there is a bias, a bit more than two orders of magnitude. But most importantly, what you can also see is that, especially in the case of the largest degeneracy, we were only able to find about a third of the minimizing configurations. The other two thirds we were never able to find. And so, of course, the next logical question is, and this is what Mario talked about before, what happens if we use stochastic k-local drivers? So he did this wonderful work where he actually enumerated all possible configurations. You saw his phenomenal slide before. And I just want to mention this very briefly. You can see very nicely in this toy example over here that if you use a transverse field driver, which I label here as HX1, you find two states with probability, sorry, pardon me, five states with probability of 20% and one state that is suppressed. If you introduce now a two local driver, you find all states with a probability of one sixth. So in this case, it works. But then if you look at the two other examples, it doesn't matter what you do. If you use two local drivers, your sampling will never be fair. So this is actually bad news because in reality, at some point, we would like to build a device that has, say, two local drivers to do more interesting things. And this means that this is something very sensitive in quantum annealing. It suggests that quantum annealing is intrinsically biased. Now, as Mario showed, we also studied um, large-scale simulations. I'm showing you here just one system size, eight squared spins with 32 ground states. We get similar results for other system sizes. Here is, again, a transverse field driver. You see that the data are biased. Simulated annealing, however, which is these blue crosses, gives you a nice flat line, meaning that you find all these states equiprobably. If you now turn on a two-local driver, and just look carefully, it's going to change, but look the same, you see that not much change. The bias persists. But not everything is lost, because we can just run the device and do some post-processing. And this is actually what I would like to talk about today. So what we did is we came up with an idea of how we can take these data that are biased or where you cannot find all the solutions and then try to, in relatively small effort, find more solutions to minimize the cost function. And for this, we use an approach that actually was never intended to be used for this type of application. So what we do is we use the so-called huda -E cluster updates that are very elegant approach that is typically used to speed up simulations for sparse systems that have frustration and disorder. Very often, this thing, when it's used as a solver, is called PT plus ICM. So this is basically the ICM part of this algorithm. Now, let me walk you through how this works, because it's very simple and elegant. What you do is you start with two configurations, alpha and beta. These are the, the top panels here on the left. These can be, say, two ground states that you found in your system. They can be just two simulation snapshots. It doesn't matter. And I use 2D because it's easier to draw pictures in 2D. Black means spin down. White means spin up. And what you then do is you multiply spin by spin, and you create what we call the overlap, which is this thing over here in this product space. So you see that when two spins are the same, you will get a white dot. When two spins differ, you get a black dot. Once you've done that, you select one of the black spins, which corresponds to a difference in the configurations alpha and beta, beta, and then you grow a connected component that I drew in here. You take this and apply it as a mask in the two initial configurations, and then you flip the spins in this mask. And what this gives you is two new configurations. Now, if you sit down and do the algebra, you'll see that this has a very nice property. Number one, by construction, the sum of the energies of these configurations is zero, meaning that if you look at the change in energy before and after the flip, one of those will go up and the other one will go down. So if you do this in a simulation, what this means is that your updates will be re rejection free, which is very efficient. But if you do know what we're interested in and you grab two configurations in the ground state, 
you cannot go at an energy below of the ground state. So if you have two minimizing configurations and you feed it into this, you potentially get two new minimizing configurations out. The only effort you have to do, which is basically n squared, is actually building the cluster and flipping those spins. So the algorithm is very simple. You use your D-wave, you do your brutally difficult simulation, it doesn't matter, you produce a handful of minimizing configurations. This is what I represent here on this pool on the left-hand side. You pick two out of here, you feed them into the cluster update. If you find something new, you add it to the pool, and then you just keep iterating. And you keep doing this until you don't find anything new. As I, again, I want to emphasize that ground states always lead to ground states, but the approach is not ergodic, meaning that you will have pockets in phase space, and you can only move within these pockets, but you cannot jump out of them and go into another pocket. However, there's always a way out, and that is you can in introduce excited states. Nobody says you can only do this for ground states. And if you toss in a few excited states, say you take a ground state and a first excited state, after a cluster update, the ground state will be lifted to an excited state, and the excited state will have to go to the ground state, meaning that you can climb out of a manifold and back into another one. Let me show you how this works. What you see here is the following. On the horizontal axis, you have the number of ground state configurations we feed into this algorithm. And on the vertical axis, you have what we get out. And you see that all dots are on the top left triangle, meaning we always get more out than we fed in. There's a couple of cases like this one right here, where it lies on the diagonal. In this case, we already knew all the minimizing configurations, so you're not going to find anything new. But if you look carefully, you will have cases like this one, where we start roughly with 15 ground states and outcome about 250. This means we can save a lot of CPU, because Finding the first set of ground states can be an exponentially large effort. Doing these cluster updates can be accomplished very efficiently. Now let me delete this, and now if you look very careful, you'll see what happens when I add first excited states to the pool. And I'm going to emphasize here, we only added first excited state. You can also add second, third, whatever you want, but we wanted to do this systematically. And if I now click this button, you'll see how these dots move, and you see how everything sprinkles up to the top. Most interesting, however, are the, the dots that actually are on this vertical line over here. In this case, we only had one ground state and added first excited states. And for the one that I chalked in up here, you can see that we start with one minimizing configuration and we generate that out of it roughly of, of the order of about 700. How does this work now on the data that I showed you before that we produced on the D-Wave? Well, this is the original data set. And now we're going to apply this post-processing to the data. And this is what you get. First of all, yes, there is still some bias left. It is a bit smaller. But most importantly, if I chalk in now again the previous data set for the largest k value, you see that we find now all states, something that we were not able to find before. So I would say this is a huge improvement. Is this of any use? I would say yes. I emphasize it's a polynomial time post-processing. It gives you better sampling. You can use this to reduce residual energies, and it has a pretty broad application scope, starting from, say, the D-Wave to molecular similarity problems to generating states for machine learning or to trying to include constraints. And something that I don't have, to, uh, have time to show you is you can also do this at finite temperature. So if you want to sample a Boltzmann distribution, you can look at problems where you have a unique solution and start with a multitude of first excited or multiple excited states and then push down the residual energies to actually find this. So it's a very nice meta heuristic for post-processing. And this is where we're developing a method that allows us to solve pubos and integer problems just based on this simple cluster updates. Good, now I'd like to switch gears from trying to improve sampling to actually making life harder for quantum annealing. And this is developing new heuristics. Now, one thing that I'd like to say here is we call it via quantum emulation, and hopefully I'll be able to show you why we think this is kind of quantum emulation. I emphasize the word emulation and not simulation, okay? And the motivation for what we developed here was actually very simple. If you look at these cluster updates in this PT plus ICM or Huda-Ye method, then those of you who have used it will know that if you have a dense graph with a high percolation threshold, sorry, a low percolation threshold, then the cluster updates become inefficient. 
And this is easy to see in 2D if I create a contrived example. You see, if I take these configurations and then I go ahead and create the connected component, which is the mask for the cluster update, if I apply this to copies alpha and beta, all that happens is that alpha goes to beta and beta goes to alpha. In other words, we don't get two new states. So in dense graphs, the clusters percolate, you get no new states, and it's merely overhead. You're wasting your time. Similarly, in methods that are tree-based, for example, like HFS, these also will degrade when you have a dense graph. So the idea was, can we come up with something that is agnostic to the topology of the system? And this is what we decided to call quantum-inspired tempering, or QUIT. The idea is very simple, and is based on this SSSV approach from 2014. We start off by taking our Hamiltonian and replacing the spins by phase angles. So what we get is a semi-classical approximation. Again, we can get the original Hamiltonian back out simply by a projection. OK, so far so good. This has been done before. The next step, instead of using annealing, we decide to replace it by tempering. Why? Annealing is a one-way optimization where you sequentially start at a large control parameter, say a temperature or a transverse field, and then you slowly reduce it down to a, a final value. This can happen that you get stuck in some metastable state. In tempering, you basically have both regimes, small, say, transverse field, large transverse field, and you allow a random walk in this control parameter. So you can basically heat up, cool down, or add more fluctuations. And like this, you have a better chance of climbing out of metastable states. Now, so far, again, not much new other than just simulating vectors with parallel tempering in the transverse field. But the reason that we went into this vector space is actually a different one. And that is that a vector Hamiltonian has a nice symmetry. And this is the following. If you now focus on this expression right here, if you think about it, any two-body Hamiltonian can be written as a single spin term, meaning that you can write it as a sum of a local field times a spin variable, where this local field H is the contribution of the neighboring spins. Okay? What you can now do is you can take your spin and reflect it on these local fields, meaning that you get this spin SI prime, and you can show that the product of SI prime times HI is the same as SI times H. But if I take this equation and sum over I on both sides, it's nothing else than the Hamiltonian. In other words, if I reflect my spin on the local field, I get a configuration that leaves the energy unchanged. So if I now do these microcanonical updates, I can shuffle my spins around actually without changing the value of the cost function. So in other words, I can wiggle my way around phase space. And hence, we're calling it quasi -inspired, quantum inspired tempering, because if you think about it, this up here is basically a quantum fluctuation. It's like a phase. And this down here allows us to tunnel around in phase space without changing the energy. Now, of course, since we have a tempering aspect to this, we need to somehow tune the control parameter. And what you see here is a phase diagram, transverse field versus temperature. Obviously, we want to find the jackpot, which is the cupcake down here. And if you think about it, when you do quantum annealing, you start at large fluctuations where you have good mixing, illustrated by a hand blender, German brand. And you sequentially reduce this to find the optimum. When you do simulated annealing, you do the same thing, except you have a slightly more powerful mixing at high temperatures. Now, if you do parallel tempering, you're still moving along this horizontal line, except that you go up and down. And in our first version of QUIT, we do the tempering, except that we move vertically at a constant temperature and change the transverse field. In version two of QUIT, we actually go along more creative paths in this phase space. Okay, so you get a mixing that somewhere lies in size between this, this, so you get one of these. How does this perform? Salvatore introduced this morning this deceptive or frustrated cluster loop problems, and I'm gonna use this here for a benchmark. Again, you start with a square lattice, you embed these frustrated loops, you then take this logical problem and toss it on camera, which means that the bonds that you had up there then correspond to the actual um, language problem intercell couplers. And 
then you study this. And what you can see is that in our very first naive implementation, this quantum-inspired tempering matches the performance of HFS. It's a little less good than PT plus ICM, but in some ways this is cheating because ICM gives an additional boost. There is a constant offset, and what is worth emphasizing is that this is not optimized. In quit version two, and again, we're still trying to figure out what the optimal path is in this phase space, we see a slightly increase in the performance, meaning slightly better scaling. You see again that there is a vertical offset. However, this is because we need more replicas to wander around some weird path. But I would say that this is competitive, and the question now is, does this performance continue regardless of the topology of the problem. Now, what I'll show you next is extremely preliminary data. Actually, Chris, who's doing this, got me this plot yesterday, which is a little closer to Gaboom than I would like. What you see here is the performance of quit versus parallel tempering at UFO, and you see that the scaling is roughly the same. Now, there is a very large offset, and there's many reasons for that, one being that one code is highly optimized, the other one is not optimized, plus we need to tune the parameters, and this can influence things massively. But the important thing that I want you to see is that the performance is the same. We also used a new approach developed by Firas Hamze with us, uh, Firas is a D-Wave, where we can plant solutions for complete graphs. So if anyone needs ground states for complete graphs, I can give you some. These are really cool problems. Again, I want to emphasize this is highly optimized, and so hopefully by the next AQC, I'll be able to push this line down to the other one. Good. And I'd to move, like to move on and show you in the last couple of minutes I have another method that we've been working on that we call population quantum annealing. And the idea for that is very simple. Some of you might remember Google's weak strong cluster problems. Hartmut mentioned them uh, in his talk. And Salvatore did this wonderful study where we tossed a bunch of different algorithms on these problems to see how the scaling performs. And what you see here is when you take these scaling plots and you fit an exponential or an exponential plus a polynomial correction, which you see here in blue, and then you look at the leading scaling exponent, then these individual bars that you see here correspond to the value of the exponent with their error. And on the horizontal axis, you have a whole collection of algorithms. I will walk you through this in a little bit. There's two important things I want you to note. Number one, the smaller this value, so for example, this box here is down here, this one's up here, the better the scaling. And number two, we looked at three typical classes of algorithms. You have the sequential ones over here, like simulated annealing, where you have one control parameter that goes down. Then we looked at methods that are tailored, like, for example, the super spin approximation over here, which is a heavily tailored algorithm, only works for this particular problem. And then we looked at generic non-tailored methods like parallel tempering. Now let me toss out all the things that are relevant in this plot and just focus on a handful of algorithms and also not really focus on the tailored problems. I want to compare simulated annealing to population annealing, SA versus PA, simulated quantum annealing to parallel tempering. And if you look, you will see that SQA and PT plus ICM are relatively close. And if you ask Daniel, he's going to say they're the same in scaling, which is good news in this case. But if you compare now simulated annealing and population annealing, you see that adding this population resampling, and I'll explain this in the next slide, gives you a noticeable performance boost. So the question to ask is very simply. Can we add resampling to simulated quantum annealing and boost its performance? Now, what is population annealing? Population annealing is also known as a particle swarm method. It's a sequential Monte Carlo algorithm. Think of it as simulated annealing on steroids. What you do is the following. Instead of doing, say, 100,000 simulated annealing runs and then seeing, doing statistics and seeing if you find the optimum, you do this 100,000 runs in parallel at the same time. And in addition to the individual spin flips that you do at every temperature step in your anneal, you compare the local Boltzmann distribution across these copies that you're simulating, and you kill off those that are suboptimal, and you repopulate with those that are optimal. So in other words, it's like an educated simulated annealing. So you do our simulated annealing runs in parallel, you resample at each step, and the important thing to note is that the resampling step is a minimal overhead. Now let me show you how well this performs. 
what you see here is the fraction of solved problems versus the population size in log 10 for a problem of roughly 512 variables in 3D and a problem of 1,000 variables. And you can see if I now focus on a population of 10 to the 5 or 10 to the 5 simulated annealing runs that were performed consecutively with all identical parameters except that one case has resampling and the other one does not do it, you see that success probabilities are boosted from roughly 30% to about 100%. And more strikingly, in the case of 1,000 variables, we were able to find almost not a single solution to the problems. But once you add resampling, you can solve almost all of them. So clearly, this thing works. And so the idea is very simple. Replace simulated annealing with simulated quantum annealing in the codes in this, in this population annealing framework, and do this for a trotterized classical Hamiltonian. Again, at this point, I only have preliminary data to show you. And hopefully next time I'll have more. Hint, hint. I want to give another talk. And again, you see the fraction of solved problems as a, as a function of population size for systems of 10, 12, and 14. Now, these are, again, frustrated cluster loops. So these are camera lattices with 10 by 10, 12 by 12, 14 by 14 logical variables. And you see that for the 10 by 10, there is not much of an effect. The problems are a bit too easy, so it's not going to do you much. But if you look already at 12 by 12 and 14 by 14, when you look at a large enough population size, you can nicely see that there is a boost in the fraction of problems solved. So in other words, this is really helping, at least with the success probabilities. And of course, the next logical step is to look at time to solutions, which is what we're doing now. So with this, I'd like to finish. Hopefully, I've been able to show you that quantum-inspired methods are potentially more disruptive than quantum annealing. Think of this. I know Murray is going to give me a dirty look soon. Think of the resampling. Hybrid approaches and specialized hardware are the future. And I feel that something like quantum inspired complements future quantum devices, especially digital machines that have no intrinsic analog errors. And with this, thank you for your attention. So we have time for maybe one or two quick questions before the break. Can you please go back to the slide where you had the quit one, quit two, and HFS, the um, performance graphs? This one, exactly. So you said that quit V2 was a little bit better than, isn't the time to solution longer? Yes, but the scaling is better. So the slope of the graph is a little bit better? Yes. OK, if, thank if you. If I were to grab that line and drag it down, you would see it clearly. Thank I, you. I should have done an animation to highlight that. OK, thank you. Great presentation, Helmut. I really enjoyed it. The, um, the, when you were talking about the ICM moves for polytime moving through the ground state space, do you have a scatter plot that shows, like, for the number of additional ground states you identified, how much time was spent on the iterative part of the algorithm to locate them? I do not have that. I would have to dig it out and show it to you. OK, cool. I, I think um, we should thank Helmut again. And you know, if, if people have more questions, ask him during the break.